this past week I was um, reminded, have you ever had a part of your body fall asleep? It's, it's a terrible, terrible feeling. And I don't know if this happens more frequently when you get older, but in my experience it's, it's happening more. And I don't know what that says. But um, some of you who are older than me, maybe you can speak into me a little bit. And, and you know, maybe Stephen can diagnose. I don't know. But there's, there's an issue there because I've noticed that this is becoming more and more of an issue in my life. Something I just didn't really, I, I, I recognized it as a kid, but it just happens more now. Uh, a few years ago, I, I actually scared myself in this because I was sleeping. I remember waking up one morning and I literally thought I've been paralyzed. Like I, th I thought like something had happened to my right arm where it couldn't, like I couldn't move it. So I, I woke up and I went to like turn off the alarm clock and it was just like, I mean, it's just, you know, and, and, and I, I'm trying to sling my arm back and forth and I'm like, what's wrong? You know, I can see it, but it, there's just no feeling there. And it, and it took a while, you know, and that finally I'm like, you know, hitting it. And, and at first I panicked because I thought, ah, like something terrible wrong has happened. And then the, like, I, you know, the more you wake up, you know, you're not in your best frame of mind when you first wake up. Uh, but the, the longer I was awake and the more, the more feeling began to kind of come as the blood began to return, what I realized what had happened was I had slept on my my arm and you know just completely cut it off and so when I woke up it was just this little thing on my on my pillow and I and I had no feeling it happened to me again a couple of nights later same thing I panicked like I was scared for a few moments not quite as long and but but now when it happens like it's I, I just like oh I, I've I've uh, you know slept on my arm wrong it's, it's falling asleep you know, it's one thing for your arm, it's another thing for your leg. I don't know if you've ever had this happen, where you're sitting down and your leg has fallen asleep and you don't know it until you get up and try to walk and then you fall face down on the ground. Right? That's a terrible feeling and you're always glad. I'm glad this didn't happen in public, right? I mean, because this would have been very foolish of me. Um, but these type of things, you know, as I've been thinking about the mission of the church... And I, I, last week we talked about how you are a part of that. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, Scripture says you are a part of the church and that your role is vitally important. And, and there's not, some, you know, this, this like difference in roles, definitely there are, are different in roles, but each role is important and the part that you play is very important. And as we looked at that, we talked about this idea that it, to, to take a portion of the body and to separate it from the rest of the body all of a sudden, it inhibits that part of the body. The part of that body, part of the body is no longer able to function. It looks the same. It sometimes acts the same, but, but it doesn't have the strength or the power like it once had. It's almost as though it's been cut off from the circulation from the blood. And in fact, what we read about in Scripture is that's why Jesus says it's so important for us to abide in him and, and for him to abide in us. That, that a grape, you know, cannot, a, a, fig, a grape bush can no longer uh, create gr grapes if it's been detached from the vine. And so we see this powerful principle getting laid out in Scripture. That as believers in Jesus Christ, we're to be attached to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as being attached to Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we're attached to the church. And that it's only then do we do, truly operate in the way in which we're supposed to operate. And my fear is that we can become so used to being paralyzed in our faith that we don't even recognize it until we go to step out on it, and then it's just not there. You see, what often happens time in, in church is that, that if we don't use our spiritual gifts and we, don't, uh, we attend service and we leave from service and we show up on Sunday morning, but really that's all our faith is about, when it comes down to a, a difficult situation, when we get the phone call or when someone says we need to talk, or, you know, the doctor is coming in the room and all of a sudden our, our faith is needed. We, we've got to got to rely on our faith. And what what can often happen is that as we step out on that which we have not used, we can stumble. And so how do we walk in a life of faith? And, and in fact, how can we ensure the victory in our in our life of faith? How can we ensure the victory within our church? How can we ensure the victory in the mission that God has presented for us. Now, if you haven't been with us for the last couple of weeks, I want to catch you up real quick and just talk about what that mission is. We, we looked at this quote, and we love this quote. I love this quote. I'm throwing that on you that you love it as well. But here's the quote. The church's mission is to glorify God by proclaiming the gospel to the lost and making Christ-like disciples who make Christ-like disciples. If that sounds vaguely familiar, it's taken from Matthew 28, 19 through 20, which says this. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. How do we ensure victory? Now I want to make one thing clear that God's church will always be victorious. He, he, he paved the way when he died and rose again, when he defeated death. It, there was always now the moment that, that Christ has won, that he will return once again for his church. But his church will always be victorious. But the problem is throughout our individual lives that, that we all have an individual part to play. You know, week one we looked at our individual role as a believer and our corporate role as a believer. And how those are both vitally important, but they're also both vitally different in the way in which it plays out. And as we looked at these, these two different roles, what we begin to realize is that even though the church has been um, guaranteed to be victorious, that, that I have to look at my own life and say, am I going to be on the winning side? Am I going to be one who gets to be in the victory circle? Or am I going to be one who is lost? Am I going to be one who, who doesn't have victory in my life? Am I going to be one who doesn't have victory over sin? You see, what we realize in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, we fight a spiritual battle, and every day it, it, it's, a, it's a decision to be made. It, it's going to affect our spiritual consequence as we go forward. But every day, make no doubt that there is a war for your soul and a war for my soul. And if you haven't really grabbed that yet, you know, maybe, maybe you think, you know, no, 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 my battle's not against, you know, darkness and principalities. My, you know, my battle's against my spouse or my battle's against my kids or my battle's against my employer. I mean, if they would just operate right, then my life would be much better. And we fail to realize that Scripture says, no, 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 it's not about our physical uh, battle as much as it is about the spiritual battle in which we face. And that's why our spiritual decisions that we make on a daily basis are so important. You know, this past week, if you turned on TV, you couldn't help but notice the coverage of uh, Senator John McCain's funeral. It seemed like it was every day, you know, and, and, and uh, rightly so. I mean, there, there's a great statesman in our country, one who deserves recognition for the things that he has done, these type of things. But as they were honoring him in different ones, it, it, it always occurred to me when I, whenever I would hear this phrase, and it, the phrase began to talk about how, how these... Uh, this life that, that uh, Senator McCain had lived, how it was really built upon these daily decisions, these things that he would do. And they would always say he was not a perfect man, but, but he, had these, these, he believed in these perfect ideals. And, and I thought, you know, as a spiritual person, as, as one who believes in Jesus Christ, as one who looks at this from a spiritual lens, how true is it that our daily decisions, the things that we believe in, truly do determine the outcome of our lives? That we don't really think about you know, going to work as that big of a deal in the big scheme of things. But the truth is that we, we face daily decisions that are determining where we're going to end up. And when we're raising our kids, we don't think about you know, Monday when they were nine and a half years old. I mean, that really isn't a big time period in our life. But what we realize as you're raising children is that each and every day is an opportunity to, to invest in their lives. And when you do it well... You know, you, you hope that they go in a, in a well, good direction. When you do it poorly and you look back and you think, boy, I wish I could redeem that time, you realize, no, those decisions have already been made. And sometimes even with the, the best decisions, even with the best intentions, our children can go off in different paths. And, and we, we wrestle with that and we struggle with that and we pray through that. But our daily decisions really do make a huge impact when they're built upon one another as we're looking at our spiritual lives. And so if we're going to ensure victory within our spiritual battles that we face, my mind was drawn to one of the greatest moments, I believe, in the Old Testament, in Joshua chapter 1. As the children of God have, have failed the test 40 years before, and they're getting a second chance. Aren't you glad that we serve a God of the second chances? Aren't you glad that we serve a God that, that is willing to forgive and to, to restore? And that's the God that we serve. 
And so today, as we talk about ensuring the victory, there may be some of those here that, that when you look at your life, you think, you know what, that, that, that would have been great to hear when I was 20. Or that would have been great to hear when, I, when my kids were little. Or that would have been great to hear a few years ago, even last week, John. But, but now it seems to be too late. And I want you to hear this if you're nothing else, that we serve a God of second chances. That we serve a God who's willing to forgive. And that today, if our heart and desire is, Lord, make me more like you. God, forgive me of my sins. We serve a God who is faithful and just and will forgive you of your sins if you call upon his name. That's the God that we serve. And so this morning, I don't want there to be a discouragement as we look at the battle. And maybe, uh, you know, what the enemy will try to do is try to bring up every poor decision we've ever made. Have you ever played that movie in your mind? It gets old really quick, but we love to play it for some reason. And we continue to rewind and rewind and wish we could make it different. And then when we can't, we find ourselves depressed and defeated. And this morning, I want you to hear that God is able to forgive. And that maybe this morning we're going to be able to stop playing that same tape. Put in something fresh and see what God has in store this day for. I want you to turn with me, if you would, to Joshua chapter 1. And as you're turning there, you may have heard the name Joshua. Joshua came after Moses. And if you remember the story, as, as the, the Israelites left Egypt, their journey was supposed to take them to the promised land. And in fact, it did very uh, quickly. Uh, it, it got them there. But then as they, they sent spies over into the promised land, they came back. And there were only two spies who, who had seen what they had saw and said, let's go. The other ten came back and reported to all of the Israelites. They said, you know, that it's a land full of giants. And in fact, there's no way that we could ever be victorious. And, and the group swayed to the, the, the ten instead of uh, obeying the two who said, you know, God has said we can do it. Yes, it's a big task, but if God said it, I think he can do it. And, and they failed to obey. And so for, as a result... They spent the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness, and all of those who had made that decision died in the wilderness, never getting to walk into the promised land. Well, Joshua is here, and he's in this same situation once again. Forty years have passed, and now he's leading this group. And now they're faced once again with the opportunity to either believe and trust the, in the God of victory or to Listen to the lies of the enemy. And here's what it says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is eight, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give you to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So Joshua is in this moment that he's been once before. And, and in this moment, he hears this word from God, that, that this promise that he had heard, and, and everyone knew the promise that had been spoken to of Moses, but he hears it once again very personally from God, that I'm going to give you the land, the same land I promised to give Moses, now I'm going to promise to give you, that as you step forward, that this region will be yours, and that everywhere you step, it'll be yours. And, you know, as we look at ensuring the victory and as we look at who God has called us to believe as believers, I think Joshua was faced with a decision. He was faced with really a kind of this watershed moment in his life. Was he going to believe on God or was he going to do what had happened 40 years ago and begin to doubt? You see, if you want to ensure the victory in your life, and I believe that if we want to ensure the victory in our church, because I think, as I said, that, that we're all in this together. And so that as we come together as believers in Jesus Christ, it's this neat thing that not only is God speaking to us as individually, but I believe that he's speaking to us corporately. And that as we look at our life, that we have to believe it will happen. That we have to believe that victory is possible. 
You see, I believe it starts with this belief that what God says is going to take place is actually going to take place. We have to believe it. You know, oftentimes as, as I've grown up in ministry and as I found myself in, in different roles, and, and some of the roles I've found myself in is, is in coaching other ministries, and, and, and it's kind of a fancy term, really just kind of talking about the church and, and just, you know, listening to the problems that specific churches go through. And as they shared these things, what I've often noticed is that when we begin to talk about the great things that to, could take place in a particular church, in a particular area, that oftentimes there's a belief that, you know what, that sounds really good, but I don't think that could happen here. I don't think God could do it here. I mean, I know God can do everything, but uh, you just don't know what it's like here. Or you just don't know what our finances are like here. Or you just don't know the history that we've had here. Or you just don't know the things that we've gone through as a church here. That there's this idea that, that even if it could be, I just don't think it's possible. I just don't believe that it could happen. And it's sad enough to see that as a church body. Well, sometimes even more heartbreaking is when I begin to talk about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And I'll have someone sit across the table or sit across my desk from me and they'll say, you know what, I just don't know if God could do that in my life. I don't believe that victory is really possible. And we always have to start there. That we have to believe what God's word says is true. We have to believe a word that says that He's not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. We have to believe a word that says that, that as we accept Christ and Jesus, that we are, are reborn, that we're born anew. That the old has passed away. Behold, all things have come new. That we have to begin to believe that God can actually do it within our life, within our church, within our, our family, within our marriage. That, that if we don't start with a belief, where do we to go from there? But we begin to believe that God can. And that reminds me of the scripture in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith and that belief is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That even though we don't see it yet, even though we don't, haven't stepped over across the river yet, that we believe that God's word is going to be true. That even though we, we maybe just have prayed the prayer and we're getting up from this altar uh, together, that when we leave the doors, we feel like, you know what, the life hasn't changed yet. I, that I'm going to encounter the same people. I'm going to encounter the same situations. But faith says, but my God is going to be with me and I believe he's going to lead me through. I believe he's going to help me to be victorious. I believe that he's going to make possible the things that were not possible when I was just doing it in my own strength. That's the God I claim to believe in. And so when we believe in something, it's not just because we can see it. Again, that's not faith. But faith is even in the absence of being able to see it immediately, we believe that it's going to take place. And sure, that's what I believe about every church that I've ever pastored. That God can do great and mighty things in and through the people of God. Not because the people are so special. Or not because our budget is so, so well. Or not because definitely you have such a great leader, which we all know is not the case. But because we serve a great God who is able. One who says, if it's going to happen, I'm going to make it happen. One who says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. That, that then I will, I will reign and, and just step back because you will not believe the things that can take place when I begin to operate with a people who believe it can take place and who trust and who follow. Church, that's the God that we serve. And so it's why I get so excited sometimes when I think about the future. It's why I get so excited when I think about what could be within a community of churches who call upon the name of Jesus Christ. It's why as I've been here for almost three years now and I begin to meet different pastors and I hear their heart for the community and I hear their heart for the ministry that God has called them to and I hear their heart for what God is doing. I just thank God there's no telling what could happen if your church would just begin to believe and say, you know what, if God is able because that's the God that we serve. And even if we've messed up in the past, and even if we failed in the past, that we've been given a second opportunity, a second chance for God to do something great, not just in my life and in my family's life, but in this community, all in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that it can take place? It's where it begins if we want to ensure the victory. Do you believe God can do it? Now, some of you may struggle and if that's your struggle, I want to encourage your prayer to be that of the disciples. Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. God, I want to believe. 
But Lord, my life just seems in complete disarray. Lord, I would love to believe, but it just seems like the enemy has came in and taken over control. And I just don't see how, God. I don't see how. Lord, I would love to, to think and to dream and imagine, but God, I just, I've been, I feel like I've been beaten down and beaten down and, and you know, torn up and chewed out and spit out. And God, I just, I just don't know if I can have the strength any longer to, to, to believe like I, I once believed. God, church, it's okay to be where you are. But don't believe that that's where God wants you to stay. But I'm so thankful we meet us, have a server God that meets us exactly where we are. We don't have to pretend. If that's where we are this morning, let's come before God and say, God, here's where I am. Lord, would you take me from here and move me to where you want to be? I believe that you can. I may not be able to see it. I may not be able to articulate it. God, I don't have a 10-year plan in my pipeline, but Lord, I just trust that you are able and that you are willing. So here I am. Use me. Do you believe that it can happen. I think secondly, as we read through John, Joshua chapter 1, verse 6, it says, The Lord said, Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. You know, it's interesting to me that these would be the words of God to Joshua. And in fact, he wouldn't just repeat this phrase once. He would repeat it a number of times in the verses that follow. Be strong and courageous. Why, do, why does Joshua need to be strong and courageous? Because the things that he's going to encounter are going to require him to be strong and courageous. Because he has a history, uh, he's leading a people with a history who have not always been strong and courageous. In fact, they've been weak and anything but courageous. <laughs> they've been weak and they've ran. This is the people that he's leading. And you know what it's like when you get around people that, I mean, you want to believe and you want to do what's right, but man, they just don't seem to believe and it seems like they're going in the opposite direction. You know how easy it is if you're not careful to fall into peer pressure. <laughs> and peer pressure, you know, and I know that doesn't stop when you leave junior high or when you leave high school, that is always present within our lives in some way or another. But how easy it is to succumb to the voice of others when you hear God's word saying, be strong and courageous. And everyone else is acting anything but. God spoke to Joshua when he said, son, I want you to be strong and courageous. Because that's what it's going to take. And if we want to ensure victory, I believe that as people of God, as men and women of God, as the church of God, that we have to stand firm. You see, we hear this word, stay, be strong and courageous, and, and it reminded me of the New Testament where we're, where we're hearing this, uh, the early disciples talking to the church, and they would always tell the church to, to stand firm in their faith, right? And in fact, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, it says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That, that when you're going into spiritual battle, you need to put on the full armor of God. And it goes through in Ephesians 5, the full armor, what that looks like and what that is. It says to put on the full armor of God so that, what? So that you can stand against the devil's scheme. So that when the battle comes, and it's going to come, and when trouble begins to arise, and it's going to arise, that you don't shrink, shrink away, but that you are strong and courageous, that you stand firm. And church, it, sometimes it, it takes... A courageous, godly courage to stand firm in the midst of obstacles coming at you. Does it not? Some of you have had things come at you and you've, you've just stood firm in your faith. And as you stood firm in your faith, God was faithful. And you didn't know how it was going to pass and you didn't know what was going to take place. But as you stood firm in your faith and you continued to believe and you continued to trust, and you continue to have courage, God brought you through. And if you want to ensure the victory, we have to become a people who learn to stand firm in our faith, who don't run at the first sign of trouble, who don't run at the first sign of conflict. You see, as, as the Israelites began to cross over, they, they would soon cross over and be faced with opposition. And I'm sure the, the words of the Lord would, would be refreshed in Joshua's mind as he would not only listen to it, but he would speak it to others. To be courageous. 
to stand firm. I think so often we're tempted to just cut and run. I think we're tempted personally when we've called upon the name of the Lord and we're trying to live the life that He's called us to live, but man, obstacle after obstacle begins to come and pretty soon it just seems so easy to kind of take the way that we know is not God's way, but it just seems like we can kind of cut through some of the suffering. Lord, if, if I can just cheat a little bit here or if I can just do these things here, then, then Lord, I promise I'll get back to where you want me to be, but I think I can, can find a way that doesn't involve conflict. I think I can find a way that doesn't involve suffering. I think I can cheat the system if I play the system well enough. And what we find ourselves on are paths that God never intended for us to be. And what seemed like it was just going to be a quick detour becomes a complete path that we find ourselves walking down. It's what sin always does. I think of the churches that I've talked to and that I've grown up in and, and I've counseled and that I've just witnessed and that, that when we're faced with opposition even within the church and, and even with brothers and sisters in Christ as we, we're sharpening one another and, and imperfect people who serve a perfect God are coming together that it's so easy for us to begin to try and take the easy way out. And instead of having that hard conversation with a brother or sister in Christ, we just stop coming for a while and hope that it will resolve itself. Or instead of walking in obedience to what God has called us to do as a belief in church, we just begin to kind of fall into the other assumptions that, you know what, I guess they're right. I guess this isn't meant for our church. I guess this isn't God's plan for our church. I guess it is just kind of, we just kind of come and go and we don't really know each other, but we say hi to one another and we fall into patterns. Or maybe, you know what, I just, I, I, someone criticized me and it hurt and I, and, I, and I just think, man, if they feel that way, then fine, I'm just not going to use my gifts anymore. And we, we take the first opposition that comes against us and it causes us to shrink back in our faith instead of being courageous, instead of standing firm in our faith, instead of knowing that, you know what, issues are going to rise. Tell me your greatest relationship. I guarantee you it's not free of conflict, is it not? There are conflicts in every great relationship. It doesn't mean you throw the relationship away. <laughs> it means that you begin to realize that this is a part of growing and that we can sharpen one another. But just because there are conflict doesn't mean that we shrink back. It means that we stand firm, that we're courageous as men and women of God. Church, if we want to ensure the victory in our life, if we want to ensure the victory in our church, that we can't shrink back every time there's conflict, every time there's a disagreement, every time that something happens where we're not quite sure, stand firm and let God go before and fight the battles. But as you continue to read Joshua, it says... In verses 7 and 8, be strong and very courageous. God repeats these words to Joshua. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. I mean, these words given to Joshua, it's, it's such a, an easy prescription it would seem, but, but the same prescription is given in our life and all of a sudden we find such difficulty in it. That if you'll just stay on the way that I have, have prepared for you, the straight and narrow way, that you can be assured success, that you can be assured victory. But yet so oftentimes we're, we're, we find ourselves looking at other directions and looking for a different way. But God would tell Joshua, and I believe the word tells us that we have to stay focused. Church, we've got to stay focused on God's word. Not just so that we can make sure others are teaching God's word, but we have to stay focused individually on God's word. What is God calling you to do? Who is God calling you to be? What is God's direction for your life? You see, I believe it's great to sit down and have conversations about what does it look like at Rock Creek Church of God for God to move in this community. And I believe it's, it's worth our efforts to look at our, our, our 
the way in which we train our volunteers. And last week we, we made a decision and 20 of you stepped forward and said, yes, I want to use my gifts to impact this community for Jesus Christ. I don't even know what that means, but I, I'm, I'm on board. And you signed up. And 10 of you have already kind of gone through this first training. But let me clarify something for you. That if we train people how to, how to do church, <laughs> but we never challenge people to be the church, then we've missed it. You see, we can gather as an organization of people and be very well organized and never lead anyone to Jesus Christ. <laughs> that that as, as a believers in Jesus Christ, I believe it's not only our due diligence to look at our gifts and to arrange them the most effective way that we can, but also as believers in Jesus Christ to be able to fall upon our knees daily and say, God, here am I. Use me. Lord, where would you have me to be ser serving today? God, God, do you have my life? All of it. Not just on Sundays when I serve from 1030 to noon, but God, do you have every piece of me? Is it my desire to be used by you on a daily basis, not just in a corporate setting, but in individual settings as well? Where would God have you be? Where would he have you serve? You see, we must stay focused, not only as a church, but as individuals, if we want to ensure victory in our life. I think the enemy loves to get us distracted. In fact, as I was studying for this week, I came across a, a, a paragraph written by Billy Graham in 2007. So it was near the end of, of his life. And he was talking about the three major obstacles that we come against in this life. And he said, you know, the first one really is, is the world. And, and when we say the world, it's so easy to kind of make that just such a huge term, that a scary word that we all, you know, kind of, uh, we don't really know what it means. But he said, but really the world can, you know, not all the world is bad. Some of the world is, is good. Uh, and he said, you know, but sometimes we can take the things that uh, are good and we can, all of a sudden they become bad in our lives. They can become idols in our lives. He said, but it starts with good intentions. You know, we, we want to provide for our family and we want to take care of our family, which is a great thing. It's a God-honoring thing. It's a scriptural thing to do. But he said, we can become so concerned with the cares of this world that all of a sudden it drives every decision. Our anxiety is based there. And, and we find ourselves worrying about the world so much that it, it begins to hinder our walk and our relationship with God. He said, we try to provide for our families, and that's a great thing. It's a scriptural thing. We work hard and that we're compensated for that work. That's all godly and that's all scriptural. But if we're not careful, that love of money can begin to, to transcend and that money begins to take the place of God. And all of a sudden, our life is not about how can we serve God. Our life is about how can we make more. And we can lose focus on who we're called to be and why we're even here. It says, then we fight ourselves. You know, the truth is, some of us don't even need an enemy. We're our, our greatest enemy. I mean, you don't, you don't need anyone else to tell you you're not worthy. You tell you you're not worthy every single day you look in the mirror. Someone once challenged me this way, and I, I was never so convicted in my life. They said, you know, I don't want to hear about what others talk about you, you know, the things that have others said, said in your life. I want to know this week... When you looked at yourself and when you spoke to yourself, was it encouraging or was it the harshest criticism that you hear all week? And oftentimes that's true for us. That even if we had no other enemies, we'd just be just fine because we've got one in the mirror that yells at us every single day. How we're not good enough, how we've messed up too bad, how we don't deserve. And oftentimes one of the greatest enemies that we have to overcome is the enemy of ourself. And finally, Scripture does talk about a spiritual enemy that's real. In fact, if you believe in Jesus, Jesus battled this enemy face to face. We talked about this in Sunday school today. In the wilderness for 40 days, as he fasted and prayed, it says that Satan came to him three separate times to try and tempt him, and it was a, a very real encounter. We serve an enemy. We, we serve the Lord God who was able to be victorious over the enemy. But that enemy is real. And as we look in our life, and as we look at the life that's ahead of us, as we look at the victory that I believe that God desires for each and every one of us, that it's God desires that no man would perish, but that all might have eternal life with him, we have to ask ourselves, do we believe it's even possible? 
We have to ask ourselves, am I standing firm in the faith? And finally, am I staying focused on the mission? Are I allowed distractions to take me so far off course? The mission isn't even a thought in my mind. I told you I was reading from Tom Rainier. Uh, he has a book, and the title of the book is this. I love the title. I don't know why I forgot it earlier, because it's great. It's a great title. Autopsy of a Deceased Church. Autopsy of a Deceased Church. What he did was he, he looked at different churches within um, the United States, that those churches that had died as a church, that they had closed their doors. And he began to see various things that were symptoms that if you were going to do an autopsy, you would say, well, this, this church died from these things. And the book kind of lays out the things that a church can typically die from. But one of the things he talks about is when a church stops praying together. Or when our prayers are become reduced to just a list of names that we pray for, that we talk about, that we you know, kind of update, how's everybody doing? It's not that we're not supposed to pray about those things. In fact, the scripture says that if any of you is sick, that we should anoint the sick person with oil. I mean, to pray over those who are sick is a very powerful and effective thing to do. But it shouldn't be the only thing that we pray about. And it shouldn't be the only time we get together in prayer. And in fact, he says this. He says, when the early, Jeruz church, early Jerusalem church members devoted themselves to prayer, they were doing a lot more than reading names off a list. They were fervent, intense, and passionate about prayer. Church, when, when the church of God in Jerusalem would gather together and pray, it was the most powerful setting that they had. Because they knew that, that the, the, the battle was, was real. And that if the battle is real, and that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spirits, the darkness, the principalities of this world, then our greatest weapon in the battle, the greatest thing that could ensure victory in the battle, is that if we pray with a heart that knows where the victory comes from. It's that if we ask the Holy Spirit to, to fill us afresh and anew and to go before us and to do that which only He can do, to change the hearts of men so that when we pronounce the gospel message that men or women are ready to receive it. You see, oftentimes we reduce this down to, to just pro programs in the church. And we think that if we get the programs in line and if we get the people in place, that all of a sudden people are going to come into the church and they're going to have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Church, it's not a program that saves anybody, but it's the power and the spirit of Almighty God who saves you and who saves me and who's still saving men and women today. But don't make a mistake that by running a well-efficient program, then all of a sudden we can do the work of the church. Church, we serve God by, by programs and programs are great. I love programs. But it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that true life change takes place. And so as we're doing the programs, and as we're ministering to others, and as we're welcoming people when they come in, and as we're serving children on Wednesday night, and as we're, we're doing ministry on the softball field to men and women of God, that as we're doing these things, that if we haven't been praying about God to move, then oftentimes I feel like we're, we're doing them without the power that is present and available. It's why prayer is so important in the church. It's why if you want to ensure victory, that, that I believe that it starts with just calling upon the name of God in your life. Asking Him to move. And letting prayer not just be something that you say before you eat the meal. And that we pat ourselves on the back because we do it in public even. <laughs> but letting prayer be something that we come before God on a daily basis and we say, God, unless you move in my life, unless you move in my family, I won't have the power to, to overcome the enemy. I won't have the power to be victorious in my marriage. I won't have the power to do what it is that you're calling me to do. God, would you move in my life? Would you move in our church? Church, we need men and women of God who will intercede on behalf of the church, who recognize that it's one of the greatest ministries that you could ever do is to say, you know what, I'm going to show up early and I'm going to stay late. And it's not so I can do anything else, but I just want to pray that God would move. And that when the gospel is preached, that people would receive it. And that those in this community who have heard it a thousand times before, that God would break through in a way that only He can. And all of a sudden it would be alive and fresh and new in their life. You see, we have people throughout this community who know all about the name of Jesus, but they don't have a changed life. Why? Because it's intellectual. 
They know the Bible stories. They know the right answers to say. But there's been a disconnect on Jesus in their life and Jesus in their family and Jesus in their marriage. <laughs> that it's not made a difference. There's a disconnect and we need people to pray and intercede. And ask God to move and say, God, would you, would you use the church? Would you, would you use us in the gifts in which we're gifted? Lord, would you use it to impact people for your name? Would you help us be victorious in this community? Because without you, we have nothing, but with you, we have everything. It doesn't matter if our facility is not right. It doesn't matter if our location's not right. You know, church... When God has a group of people who understand where their power comes from, He can use them in any location, in any setting. God can move. Revival can come. Men and women can be saved. Marriages can be restored. Addictions can be broken. That doesn't happen without prayer. So I want to call you today as we conclude this series to, to be in prayer about the mission of God in your life and for this church and ask him to move and maybe you've never prayed that way don't make it more difficult than it is simply ask God God we need you would you be more real in my life would you speak clearly to the things that I need to do Lord would you let me have a hunger and a passion for your word God, would you show me where to use my gifts in ministry so that I, I'm a part of what God is doing in this community? God, would you not, not, not be shrink back to every word of criticism or conflict that comes up, but Lord, would you let it embolden me knowing that there's only opposition when you're in the midst of the battle? Church, sometimes I think we need to realize that, that if there hasn't been opposition in our life for a while, it may mean that we've walked off the battlefield. It may mean that we've gotten off mission. It may mean that maybe God is saying, look, son, daughter, I want you to use your gifts. And yes, you're going to encounter opposition, but I'm going to be with you all the way. And victory is on the other side. I don't know where you are today, church, and I don't know if there's anyone here who doesn't know a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. But if you're far from God this morning, you don't have to leave this building far from God. God is here and he loves you and he desires to forgive you and to have a relationship with you. If you've heard about the mission all your life, but you've never really been on mission, God wants to put you on mission today. And it's okay that you don't know what steps that means. And it's okay that you don't know exactly what that looks like. That's faith. That's saying, God, I'm going to cross this river even though I don't know what's on the other side. But I know you've called me to cross. I know you've said I'm going to be victorious. So I'm going to trust you every step of the way. Church, maybe this morning your response is to sign that card again and say, I, I want to get involved. I don't know how, but I just want to get involved. I don't know where you are on that spectrum, but I just know that God has a desire to move. And that he has a desire to fill your life with his spirit and to let you be victorious over sin. Some of you have battled with sin for so long, you feel like it's just going to be naturally a part of you until the day you die. That's a lie from the enemy. God has come to break chains, and he's the one who can. But I want to pray for you this morning as we close, and I'm going to invite Wayne to come. And if you'd like to respond, these altars are open. Won't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God. Lord, I come as one who's so thankful that you are a God of second chances. Lord, I come as one who just has, has experienced failure and what it feels like to have your Heavenly Father lift you back up and dust you off and set you back on course again. God, as I've experienced that, Lord, I know that there are many who need to experience that in their life. Lord, some of us here today, we're struggling with belief. And God, I pray that you would speak directly into each individual. And let them hear the words that you are able. 
Through Jesus Christ, we are able. As a church, we are able to do the things that you have called us to do. Lord, that we would stand in the truth. Lord, the enemy would love to confuse us this morning, love to fill our minds with with lies of deceit. God would love to let us feel as though we're unworthy or that if everyone knew, no one would want us. Lord God, that you would just let there be truth that we stand upon this morning, that no one is worthy. It's why you came and died. But Lord, as you died, you made it possible for us to be worthy through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. So if we've accepted that sacrifice, God, we are now made worthy. Lord, and let us stay focused this morning. Lord, already our mind is wanting to wonder. Our mind is wanting to know where we're going to lunch and what we're doing afterwards. And, and this was kind of stirring, but, but, but I've got real life to, to encounter this week. And I've got you know, the, the deal to close. And I've got that conversation I've got to have. And Lord, would you just keep us focused in this moment and help us to realize that we could accomplish everything in this world. But if we fail in a relationship with you, we've lost everything. God, that you desire a personal relationship with us and that as believers in Jesus Christ, that puts us on mission. Lord, and as we put you first in our life, everything else will be added, but God, we have to start with you first. Lord, you've gifted each person accordingly. I pray that you would show them more and more how to use those gifts. Lord, speak to us this morning. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, won't you stand this morning as we sing? These altars are open. If you'd like to pray, let's ask God to do something great as we are on mission for Him.